Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's free CompTIA a certification training course. I'm James Messer, and in this module, we're going to talk about printing and scanning components, consumables, and interfaces. This comes from our CompTIA a certification essentials exam, our 220-601 exam, in section 4.1, where we need to identify names, purposes, and characteristics of printer and scanner components. We also need to do that of the interfaces that are used by printers and scanners. And we're going to step through all of that in this module. We're going to not only learn about the components, we'll talk about feeding paper into printers and scanners and how that works, understand what the consumables we might expect to find in different printers and scanners, and what interfaces are used, not only in printers and scanners today, but some that you might have in a legacy environment. Let's start with understanding more about the components of printing and scanning. One of the things that you'll run into when you first install a printer is needing to have the proper drivers. And so we see this from time to time where we have printer and scanner drivers that we're installing. In fact, this is the Add Printer Wizard that we have inside of our Windows device. And what we're doing is installing and, and adding on the capabilities that our computer will use to talk to our printer. And the, there are many, many different drivers. There's a different driver for every printer that's out there. And you'll notice when you go into Windows and you start installing these drivers, you have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of printers to choose from. And that's because every printer is a little bit different. They're very specific printer drivers for the model we're using. And in some cases, there are multiple drivers for the model we happen to be using. These are incredibly important because each driver understand the, understands the language of the printer, whether it's a PostScript printer or a PCL printer or any other type of printer language that it uses. How many paper trays are in the printer? Is it a color printer? Is it a black and white printer? What fonts are embedded inside the printer? Many, many other options. To give you a feel for what this looks like, I have two properties side by side. This is an Epson Laser Action Laser 1000. And this is the properties for an HP LaserJet 8150. These are the same Windows front end. It's the properties page under device settings for each of these printers. Now you'll notice the Epson LaserJet, this Action Laser 100, has a couple of options. It has an upper paper tray, a manual paper feed. There's a lower tray. There are font cartridges available if you need to install font cartridges in the printer. And we can see how much memory is inside of it. Now, the HP LaserJet 8150 is a much larger printer. This is really designed to be a huge enterprise printer. There are a lot of different trays, tray 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. In fact, tray 4 can have different sizes, a 2,000 or 500 sheet tray. We've even got an, a manual feed and an envelope feeder on it as well. So a lot of different places you can pull the paper from. There's also three slots for font cartridges and much more that I couldn't even fit on this screen. So you can start to see now why the driver is so important. And when you get that printer and you install the driver, this is where all of this information is coming from. When you're ready to print from your spreadsheet, when you're ready to print from your word processor or your browser, this is how your computer knows exactly what's available in that printer and how you should print. One component you'll also find inside of your printer is memory. This is really important for printing and scanning because there's a lot of buffering that takes place, especially on laser printers. It, the entire page, as we mentioned in a previous module, is rendered inside of the laser printer. The laser printer doesn't print a little bit at a time. It prints one entire page at a time. And it won't begin printing until that entire page is inside the printer. And it essentially builds the picture of what it's ready to print. Because we're doing that, we're using memory inside of that laser printer. So the more complex the image, the more complex the page of information, the more memory we're going to use. If this is a picture or if it's graphical, we're going to use more memory than if it happens to be just a page full of text of letters. So it's really important when we start to get into printing and doing things with our printers that we're using and have the proper amount of memory available inside of it. Now, memory is also important in other printers as well, not just laser printers, but inkjet printers and scanners. Uh, this memory can be used as a buffer. If you've ever printed to a printer that's locally connected to your device, maybe via a USB cable, and we're sending information off to that printer, if you're ever watching the queue inside of your Windows front end, one thing you'll notice is that the printout leaves the queue. It disappears, but it's still printing out. It's not done. It may be on the second page, and you've got four pages that you're expecting to print. But as far as your computer is concerned, you're done. It's finished. That's because inside of your printer, there's memory that has buffered this 
this page, these extra two pages to print, and now it's all up to the printer to take care of everything else. Kind of the Windows front end is all done with sending that printout, and it's the memory inside that printer that has now that image set up that it's now going to print out for us or the text that we've had in those other two pages. Also inside of our printers and scanners, we have firmware. Just as we have firmware for our desktops and our laptops, our BIOS that we have, we also have firmware inside of our printers and scanners. Now, we don't update the printer and scanner firmware very often. Usually, we're updating it because something isn't working right with the driver that we've loaded in the operating system. So it's not usually something that's required that we update. But sometimes we do want to stay up to date because there can be new features. We usually, this comes directly from the printer or scanner manufacturer. So you go to their website, you look at their support page for the printer you happen to have, and they'll tell you if there's an update to the firmware that happens to be inside of that, that printer. And it's really useful to have that because very often there will be something new or a bug fix associated with the firmware. The way that we update these devices is usually via a USB connection or over the network. Prior to having that type of connectivity to these printers, there wasn't an easy way to update the firmware inside of printers. Usually if it's an older older LaserJet printer or older printer, we have to physically change chips inside of those devices. So those really didn't get updated very often because there really wasn't a very good reason to open up the printer, take the chips off the motherboard, replace the chips, unless there was something really wrong, something not operating properly inside of that printer. The upgrade for that BIOS, for that firmware, is the same as doing a BIOS upgrade on your laptop, on your desktop machine. You want to be sure that it doesn't power off in the middle of anything, that you're not using it at the same time. It's all of those things. If you go back and look at our BIOS upgrade video that we have, we're talking about doing some of those things. Those same safety requirements apply. We want to be sure that we're not doing this in the middle of a thunderstorm where we might expect the power to go out. Because if it does happen to be in the middle of the update, is this you're updating the firmware and it powers down, there's a very good chance it's just going to be a brick at that point. There's no way to get that machine back the way it was unless you are swapping some chips out. So you don't ever want to be in that type of situation with your printer upgrade. With both printers and scanners, there's a need to get paper into the device, whether it's a piece of paper that we want to scan or it's a blank piece of paper that we'd like to print things to. There's many different ways to get the paper inside of it. Uh, one very common way is through something called a friction feeder. It is using essentially exactly that, friction. It uses these little rollers on, side of your, on the side of your printer or on the side of your scanner to pull in those things. Usually that's done one page at a time. And it's using rollers. And if you ever look at the preventive maintenance, there's a module that we have for preventive maintenance of printers. One of the things they always ask you to do is clean those rollers off. Because the cleaner they are, the easier they're going to grip that paper using the friction and pull it into the printer. There's also something called continuous feed paper. This is a picture of some continuous feed paper. You've seen these before, I'm sure, with these little holes that are down the side. The holes are there because there are rollers inside of the printer that is pulling those things through with little pins. And so that's the way that it keeps those continuous piece of paper rolling through that printer. It's got perforations between the sheets, so it is able to break those off when one sheet is done. But it is essentially, if you ever look at the box of paper behind it, one long sheet of paper that's just being pulled through with these little holes on the side. There's also a type of paper feeding technology you'll run into called duplexing. That means that we're going to print on both sides of the sheet of paper inside of the printer without having the printout come out and you manually flip it over and sending it back through. Usually this is an add-on that you can purchase along with the printer. Not every printer supports this, unfortunately, because it's really useful. You are printing on that, uh, that other side of the piece of paper, so it does save a lot of paper. And If you're into saving environment and you make sure you don't want to spend a lot of money on paper, some of this duplexing technology can pay for itself over time. One consumable you'll run into a lot, especially in enterprise environments with lots of laser printers, is something called toner. This is a picture of a toner cartridge. You can see they're relatively large. They're pretty bulky. And they contain this powdered ink inside of there. It's a carbon type ink that's in that piece. It's really designed for laser printers. And if you go back and look at one of the modules we have on laser printers, the introduction to printers and scanners, we talk about the process of how it uses that powdered ink to stick to the piece of paper. And then we, we fuse that paper using heat and pressure. The, what we're doing is really melting this toner 
onto the paper. And so it's full of toner. You want to be careful when working with this that you don't accidentally spill any of the toner out of this. If you shook it really hard, it does come out of there. It's supposed to come out inside of the printer, though, onto the sheet of paper. You don't want it going out anywhere else. Because this is a big plastic cartridge, you really don't want to throw this away. That's just wasteful. You can fill this back up with toner and use it again. So in most environments, they have a recycling program that allows you to take an empty cartridge and send it off to be recycled. Now replace whatever parts in here need to be replaced. But the essential piece of plastic and some of the other photosensitive drums that are inside and other pieces can be used over and over and over again. If you've worked at all with inkjets, you know they go through a lot of ink. And one of the consumables you'll see in those environments are the replacement cartridges. These are very proprietary. You buy a replacement cartridge from a manufacturer to fit into their printer. And they are very specific cartridge types that must match the cartridge type used for your printer. If you've ever walked into an office supply store, you'll notice there will be wall space. Just goes way down there with all of the different printer ink cartridges that you can purchase. This is a picture of some of them on the screen here from Canon and from HP. There's a lot that you can choose from. These are also different depending on the printer type. The printer manufacturers try to sync up across many different models of their printer line so that they'll use the same cartridge type. But unfortunately, every year they seem to update these printers. And every year they also seem to update the cartridge method that's used. So not only are they proprietary between manufacturers, usually a manufacturer will also have many, many different kinds of a red cartridge, a blue cartridge, a yellow cartridge, and a black cartridge. So you need to keep up and make sure that if you're going to purchase new cartridges, that you're purchasing the ones specific for the model. Usually that's well documented exactly which one you might happen to need. These are sometimes managed by these chips that are inside of your printer and on the cartridges themselves so that you must use that specific cartridge. You can't use a third party. So you'll notice that there are only cartridges made by HP for HP printers. And there's no nobody else making cartridges for an HP printer. Why is that? Because the manufacturers of those printers don't want you using other people's cartridges. I thought this would be interesting to show why that would be necessary. Is This is something you put outside of your printer that you'd fill up with black and cyan and magenta and yellow. And you have this all connected via this tubing into your existing cartridges. So these are cartridges that work inside of your inkjet printer today. But this big piece is sitting outside of the printer. So what you're able to do is essentially keep filling up this area here. And it keeps feeding ink into your printer. You don't have to keep buying cartridge after cartridge after cartridge. Well, that's a little extreme, but things like this do exist in the industry. And you may run across one from time to time. But you can start to understand now what extent people have gone to just so they don't have to spend a lot of money on ink for their inkjet printer. Very common consumable for printers is paper. We're going to need paper to print things out on. There's many different types of paper. You'll see that there's paper that is specifically designed for inkjet printers. There's paper specifically designed for laser jets. There's specific photo paper. And that's because these different printing technologies put different kinds of ink onto the paper, different amounts of ink. They dry in different ways. And so the paper that we're putting on there really does need, really helps a lot if it's designed for that specific printer type. That way your inkjet output doesn't come out smeared and your laser jet is fusing it exactly the way you would expect to the paper. There's also different colors of paper, not just colors in the red, yellow, green type papers, but also different brightness of white. And you'll see this listed on the paper pack itself, that it's a 92 brightness or a 97 brightness. There's different ways to calculate brightness. In the United States, we tend to calculate it based on a percentage. So the 92 and 97 is a percentage of brightness of white. There are other uh, ISO ways to look at the brightnesses. And you'll just have to refer to your piece of paper to see how bright the whites are. And you may want different brightnesses depending on what you're doing with that paper. Another characteristic of paper is that there is a weight associated with it. This is literally the weight or the thickness of the pieces of paper we happen to be using. The higher the weight, the thicker the paper, the heavier the paper. And so you'll see something called a basis weight, a 24-pound paper or 28-pound paper. 
This quite literally refers to the large size of paper before it's cut into smaller reams uh, of paper. In the United States, we measure this in pounds. So if you're in the U.S., you'll see the paper called a 24-pound, a 28-pound, and different pounds of paper. Just keep in mind, as the numbers go up, the heavier the paper gets. So if you're using this for something that's going to be permanent, maybe it's a presentation, you might want to use a, a higher a higher weight of paper. If this is something just going to be used in your office for scrap paper, for something you're going to print out as a draft, maybe the smaller paper sizes are what you're looking for. Well, now that we've gotten different inks and we've gotten different papers for our printers and our scanners, let's talk about how we would physically connect to those printers and scanners. If we're locally connecting, which means we're plugging directly in from our computer into the device, there are a few interface types we can look at. One that's extremely old, but you still see it from time to time on older printers, is something called a serial connection. That serial connection is one that has a very small 9 or 25 pin connection on the back of your computer. One that's probably more common for printers and scanners is a parallel connection. And he uses a specialized plug called a Centronics plug. This, again, is more of a legacy type connection. You don't see those much on the newer printers, but it is a plug that you'll run into a lot with printers. Very, very common in printing technologies. There's also these days USB, universal serial bus. USB is the, the method of really most printers and scanners these days for connecting into your computer. And it's used for many different types. There's many different connections for USB cables. Usually the one you'll see is this type A connection that's used. And it's used not just for printers, but for scanners, for your mouse and your keyboard. Many different components these days are using universal serial bus. It really is becoming that universal connection for your computer. Another type that you'll see for devices that you're going to send a lot of information to, especially high-end scanners, high-end printers, they may use FireWire. You'll also hear this referred to as IEEE 1394. So FireWire is just another interface that's used on these systems. It's one that you don't see quite as common as USB, but you will run into it from time to time. If you're working with some legacy scanners, you'll find that those use an interface type called SCSI, S-C-S-I, Small Computer Systems Interface. That SCSI connection was designed in the past to transfer very large amounts of data, which is exactly what we're doing when we're scanning an image into a scanner. We need to pull it into our computer. And at the time, there was no USB. We needed some very standardized format to be able to pull it in. And so you had to usually buy a separate card, install it into your computer that was a SCSI connection card, and we would plug a cable into that card and into the printers, into the into the scanner that we were using. And then there were specialized drivers for your SCSI card and specialized driver for the scanner to finally get all of those things working together. Boy, that wasn't easy, was it? USB is so much easier these days. I've got a USB port, I plug into USB on my scanner, and I'm done. But if you're ever working with some older legacy scanner systems, you're going to run into those SCSI interfaces. If the printer or scanner is not connected to your device, then there are other ways to connect through a remote interface. And one of the most common is one for networking. There's a network card that's physically connected inside of that printer or inside of that scanner. And so you see an example of this here. This is a network interface card or a NIC. Some people call it a NIC card, a little bit redundant, but you'll hear it referred to in many different ways. And what happens is inside of the printer is very often a print server. You don't need any additional hardware. You don't need any additional server. You just take your Ethernet connection. You plug it into this connection that's on the back of your printer now into that RJ45 jack. And now your printer becomes available on the network. You can see it through your printer front end in Windows. And this is very easy to do. These interfaces are usually either embedded within the printer when you get it, or they're an add-on like this adapter is, so that you're able to now connect it up to your network. And then everybody who's on the network can now use that printer, even though it's not physically connected to their computer. Another way to do it, and probably one of the newer ways, is via wireless. You see this a lot on the all-in-one devices as well. And you can buy separate print servers like this one here that plugs in wirelessly and connects to your computer via USB. And this is usually using 802.11 technologies. We also can see wireless printers that have infrared connections on them, which are usually close by. Infrared doesn't go very far. And neither does Bluetooth. Those are more personal area connections. You'll hear them referred to. It might be a printer that's in the same room with you you, and you just don't need to plug a wire directly into it. So you'll often see the network connections, especially 802.11 and the other wired Ethernet connections used in environments where there are many computers, and the infrared and the Bluetooth used environments where it's just one computer that needs to connect to it wirelessly.
In review, we've looked at many different printer technologies. We've discussed how papers fed into the printer and scanner. And we've talked about the different components inside of these devices. We've stepped through what the consumables are that you might expect to purchase or need to purchase for your printers and scanners. And we finally talked about the interfaces involved with your printing and your scanning technologies. For more A-plus videos, to participate in our message boards, and much more, you can visit our website, freeaplus.com.